Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Kate Pickett. I'm Professor of Epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences here at the University of York, and I'm co-founder and chair of the Equality Trust. Today's event is the annual Richard Wilkinson Lecture for the Equality Trust, part of York's Festival of Ideas Online. And although in a different format, the festival continues to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. The 2020 festival has got over 60 online events, offering an inspiring program for people of all ages. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the adventure we're about to take you on and that you'll sample more offerings from the festival over the coming days. A few technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This is available throughout the talk, so post your questions at any time and I will be picking them up later on and, and posing them to our guest. If you have technical issues and lose your Wi-Fi, you can just rejoin the event using the original link. Um, today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again. Since 2017, the Equality Trust has held the annual Richard Wilkinson Lecture. Richard Wilkinson would like me to point out that he's not dead yet, and this is not a memorial lecture. In fact, he's sitting across the um, corridor from me, but he's not able to join us live because we don't have enough bandwidth. So he won't be able to pose any questions of his own today. But the purpose of these lectures is to disseminate the latest research on socioeconomic inequalities from world-renowned experts, um, academics and practitioners in the field. And these events increase public engagement about inequality and encourage attendees to join the movement to tackle inequality in the UK and beyond. And in this time of the COVID-19 crisis, <laughs> we have a sharper focus on the inequalities in our society perhaps than ever before. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Professor Lord Richard Layard. Um, Richard is founder and former director of the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics and was the programme co-director for Wellbeing. He wrote the groundbreaking book, Happiness, Lessons from a New Science, which was published in 2005. And Richard, that was an absolute model of how to convey science and statistics to a lay audience. And um, I learned a lot of lessons from you on how, how to do that. Um, he's written many other things, but he co-edits the annual World Happiness Report. Um, he's been instrumental in the development of improving access to psychological therapies in the UK. And today he's going to talk to us um, on the basis of his new book, um, Can We Be Happier? Arguing that the goal for society must be the greatest possible all round happiness, giving us hard evidence of how that is the right aim and how it can be achieved. So I'm going to hand over to Richard. He'll talk to you for about 45 minutes and then I'll come in and pick up questions from you all and we'll have a question and answer session. So Richard, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really lovely to be here. And um, I'm greatly honored to be asked to give this lecture. I've always been a huge admirer of Richard's work, um, even before he piled up with Kate, <laughs> and even more since he has. I think they've made an extraordinary contribution um, and everybody around the world has learned from it. So what I want to talk about, as Kate said, is uh, what, should be the objective for our society uh, and how can we uh, achieve it and i think the objective should be the one uh, that was uh, proposed in the great 18th century enlightenment that we want a society uh, where people are happy enjoying their lives fulfilled uh, and completely satisfied uh, with their experience uh, on this earth that that is the objective um, and I think that's the greatest idea of the modern age, a vision of a society in which people are fulfilled, flourishing and uh, happy. The, uh, the question then, of course, is how you get to it. Um, and until recently, it's not been uh, too easy to discuss that because there wasn't that much evidence on what makes people uh, happy. But there now is a, a great new science of happiness, and that makes it practical uh, to discuss this, both in terms of how we can improve our, our own happiness, but even more how we can 
improve the happiness of the people around us uh, and of the whole society. Um, and that's what this book's about. Now I am faced with the one technological challenge of this hour. So that's the book, which Kate very kindly mentioned. And here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, as I said, the goal for society. Second, the science of happiness, which helps us to achieve the goal. And then how that's applied in four areas, uh, area of mental health, education, uh, employment, um, and the overall uh, role for the government. <clears throat> so let me start with the goal. Um, and this is the, the key principle, uh, which everything else has to be related back to, that the best state of a society is when there's the most happiness. And that, of course, is true in particular. Uh, we want uh, uh, as much happiness as possible for the people who are least happy. So we pay more attention uh, to the removal of misery than we do to uh, pushing people to the upper ends of bliss. Uh, that is the objective and everything else flows from it. Um, both the basic principles of how we should live ourselves, um, which is the issue of ethics, um, and the issue of how we want our government uh, to proceed, which is the issue of politics. Uh, so on ethics, our aim should be, each of us, uh, to produce the best state of society and so far as we can influence it, which means to produce the most happiness we can in the world. And similarly, we want the government to create the conditions for that same outcome, for the greatest possible happiness. I think this is a wonderfully clear way of thinking about uh, essentially everything. What, what is the ultimate objective? Um, so just going uh, through those two aspects, the ethical goal, um, if you ask yourself, what, what is the goal which society is offering our young people today? I, I suppose uh, that you would say that above all, it's you've got to be personally success, successful, um, especially compared with other people. You've got to get better grades, uh, you've got to get better income, you've got to get better jobs. And of course, that comparative objective to excel relative to others um, is a completely zero sum objective at the level of society, because for every winner, uh, there's a loser. And even if we <laughs> exhort our children to compete more and more fiercely, and they do so, the well being of society can't go up. Uh, it is a dismal, completely counterproductive objective. The objective has got to be positive sum, where we're trying to uh, do things which um, increase the happiness of other people rather than uh, uh, challenging their happiness. And that has got to be the objective uh, that we get as much as possible of our happiness uh, from making other people happy. Uh, so there's the objective. I think this is an inspiring kind of a vision because this um, focusing on um, sort of making the most, you've got to make the most of yourself, not you've got to contribute the most to the world, but you've got to make the most of yourself. This is an, an extraordinarily anxious making um, objective, um, producing far too much absorption in yourself, which of course is one of the main causes of misery. And we see the huge stress that many young people are feeling today because of this counterproductive philosophy of life. Now, I think a, a new culture um, of wishing to contribute uh, to the well-being of others, that's a central objective, um, needs supporting organizations. Um, there's never really been a, a, a culture in human history which hasn't had organizations like churches, synagogues, mosques, or other, other similar organizations where people meet around the issue of their fundamental goals to be uh, inspired, supportive, uh, and uplifted. Um, which is the reason why I want to just say a word about Action for Happiness, which is the movement which 
um, we founded uh, now nearly 10 years ago. And the philosophy there is that people need to get together with other like-minded people regularly around these issues. Uh, they need, it needs to be made easy for them to do it. So they need to have really good materials uh, around which they can get together. And that's what Action for Happiness groups are. They um, start with a course um, around the basic principles, uh, an eight session course. Um, and then the groups continue to meet uh, at least monthly after that. Uh, and uh, I take no credit for this because I wasn't involved in it, but it is extraordinary, uh, the success of this course in transforming people's uh, outlook on life. Uh, and I just wanted to show you this as a, a sort of first taste of how one can make life better. Um, this is uh, a randomized controlled trial uh, of people taking the Action for Happiness course, um, where it measured uh, many things, but in this, in this particular case, uh, their satisfaction with life, uh, at the beginning and again two months after the end of the course. And the effect uh, on uh, happiness measured on the scale of zero to 10 was one whole point increase, which as you can see is bigger than the effect of getting a job or, or finding uh, a partner. Uh, and uh, I, I can't uh, go through in great detail the elements of this philosophy, obviously, um, but the, the basic issues are that you must learn how to care for yourself and care for others. It's the, uh, the, the mask in the aeroplane principle oxygenate yourself, but that then go on uh, to oxygenate others. Uh, and the, the, the fundamental principle, which I think uh, has revolutionized our ability to take care of ourselves better, um, comes from uh, originally cognitive behavioral therapy, but then moving on for all of us to positive psychology. And of course, uh, the use of great techniques coming from the East, especially mindfulness. Um, I won't go on about that, but I think that this is a, a, a huge uh, thing that is helping individuals to care for themselves. But then, of course, it's crucial that they care for others. And compassion has to be a central bit uh, of any philosophy of life. But uh, com feeling compassion is an important starting point, but then you need also to know what we have to do. <laughs> for other people, we need to know what uh, makes people happy. Uh, so uh, that brings us to the science. Uh, the science of happiness uh, is the most rapidly growing uh, of all the social sciences. And I'm including other phrases like uh, well-being, subjective. No, no, not just well, not, not well-being, uh, subjective well-being, something that's clearly related to how people feel the quality of their experience of life, um, as well as happiness. But you'll see that there has been just an explosion of articles, even in the economics journals. Um, the problem with these articles is that they all have a slightly different measure of happiness. They all hold different uh, other variables constant. And to help readers get a grip on what the overall message is coming out of it, uh, we wrote this book called The Origins of Happiness, uh, where we use mainly uh, the great longitudinal surveys being done in Britain, uh, Germany and Australia, but uh, <coughs> also some American material uh, to try and find out what is, are the determinants of happiness over the, the life course. Um, and, and these are the findings. So let me start. Um, with the uh, social factors. Uh, and these come from another set of evidence um, in the World Happiness uh, Report. Every year, um, John Halliwell does a wonderful analysis of the factors which explain the differences um, between uh, the populations of different countries. And uh, I just want to stress three of them here. Um, the quality of government is very important, whether it's uh, 
benevolent or corrupt, uh, the strength of social support. Do you have somebody who you can rely on uh, in time of trouble? And trust, do you trust uh, other people uh, or uh, can you trust most other people or not? Um, obviously, freedom and peace are also important, but you see these factors here. These are things that vary enormously across countries. Um, the importance of the quality of government, social support and trust um, is that they uh, explain the uh, greater levels of happiness in Scandinavian countries than in any other countries. <coughs> and you'll see the opposite at the very bottom end of the scale. So I would say that this sort of evidence is strongly supportive of the kind of things that Richard uh, and Kate uh, have been saying um, about the importance of equality, which is highly correlated with social support, trust, uh, and quality of government. I'm not going to go on at great length about that because I think that um, probably the, the people who are listening to this talk um, have been fully persuaded of that uh, by Richard and Kate. I'm going to concentrate a little more on personal factors. Um, so I'm going to talk about mental and physical health uh, as the single most important uh, variable. Um, human relationships, the next most important variable, uh, and, and then uh, income. And uh, let's uh, look at the, the evidence on the uh, importance of these. So, if we're talking about inequality, um, the most important inequality, uh, I would say, is the inequality of well-being essentially the quality of life as a person experiences it. And as is recorded, for example, in their answer to the question, how satisfied are you with your life these days? Um, and the results here are, are, I think, very striking and very significant. The biggest single factor explaining that variation um, is the answer to a simple question, have you ever been diagnosed with anxiety or depression? Um, so mental health is exceptionally important um, and probably corresponds, if you think about it, to your uh, experience of the people you meet. Quality of work is also extremely important, including obviously relationships um, with your line manager, which is <clears throat> very, very important to many people. Uh, then whether you have a, a partner, sorry for the spelling, um, then physical health. Uh, 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 and then income. Uh, unemployment is, of course, a terrible experience, but fortunately, um, at most times, not now, unfortunately, but most times, and that's what this relates to, um, unemployment uh, affects the smallest number of people and therefore uh, explains less of the scale of misery in our society than is explained by things like mental health, an appalling boss, uh, disastrous personal relationships, health or poverty. Um, so let's uh, move on from this backwards because obviously many of these things are much affected by what happens to you in your childhood, um, uh, which enables you then to, to get into a good, good or bad state in your adult life. So these figures that you're looking at now relate to the factors, the current circumstances affecting uh, distribution of well-being amongst adults. But if I ask you, what do you think is the best predictor uh, of uh, a, a happy adult life when you, all you know is what the person is like at the end of childhood? Um, I wonder what you'd say. Um, probably by now you'd give the right answer, <laughs> which is that uh, grades are not the best predictor. Uh, qualifications, even right up to the PhD, are a, a worse predictor of whether you'll have a happy life than answers to a simple emotional health question taken at the age of 16. Um, it, it, it is remarkable. And this, of course, has huge implications uh, for the school system, which we'll come on to 
in a moment. Um, but then you might say, well, can schools really do anything about the emotional health of their children? And this is the extraordinary finding that we got uh, from the uh, Avon longitudinal study of children born in, in Avon in the early 1990s. But if you take emotional health at 16 and you try and explain it by everything you know about a, a child's family, and then you add in simply uh, the name of the secondary school they went to and the primary school they went to, you can see that taken together, the schools are explaining more uh, of the variation in emotional health at 16 than everything we know about the families. And uh, this means that nobody should accept the argument, you know, that schools uh, can't do anything and don't do anything uh, about uh, the health of their children, emotional health of their children, because they do. Uh, the, and the point is, therefore, uh, we want to get them to do it better. <clears throat> so that's my, my, my little summary of some science. Uh, let me now move on to the four areas I want to talk about, mental health, schools, business and government. So um, I think that the absolutely top priority, if I had some money, is to get better treatment uh, for people suffering uh, from mental health problems, including children. Um, something like 20% um, of uh, people at any one time are suffering from a mental health problem, um, and something like 40% will at some time in their lives. Uh, let me just quickly go through these different types of problems because I, I think people don't, they tend to think of mental health as a sort of smallish uh, little bit of the health uh, service and <clears throat> the health uh, and the problem of problems in society. I think it's a very big part of the problems in society. Uh, and of course, it, it's caused by all sorts of things. I'm not now talking about the ultimate causes, I'm talking about treating uh, the problem when it is presenting itself. <clears throat> we'll go back to prevention in a moment. So we've got good therapies for depression, anxiety disorders. Um, and uh, you can see that because uh, depression, anxiety uh, have such bad effects on people's ability to work, um, that if you treat those problems and more people are able to work, the savings on benefits and also actually on physical health care um, are in fact greater than the cost of the therapy. So this was a case which we made uh, to Tony Blair and uh, we managed to get this service called Improving Access to Psychological Therapies established. <coughs> it has a different name in, the, in, in every area, but we're now in that service treating 600,000 people a year. Um, and after an average of seven sessions, we're having 50% recovery rates. But of course, we should be doing the same uh, for children. Um, and it really is shocking that uh, unless a child uh, is stabbing his sister or in a, a really terrible state um, and gets uh, referred to CAMS, um, they normally get sent away. Uh, with the uh, um, ju judgment that they're not sick enough for treatment. We've got to have a, a, a system of treating <coughs> um, a child anxiety, conduct disorder and depression in the same way that we have been constructing for adults. Um, there is now, as a result of the government green paper, um, a programme to set up mental health support teams that are school-based. Um, but they're being rolled out quite extraordinarily slowly um, to cover a third of the country um, over the next few years. Um, th this is an absolutely crying need uh, to progress with this as well as with adults. But then I want to stress this group. Here are so many problems, which you might call social problems, 
Um, they, they're caused by many social and personal factors, um, but they are in incredible source of suffering and chaos in our society, substance abuse, gambling addiction. I'm on a, uh, a really interesting and important House for Lords committee to reform the gambling laws. Um, domestic violence now coming up uh, to the front in public policy debate, previously hidden, family conflict of all sorts. These, all of these problems have got evidence-based treatments, which are simply not provided. It's a complete disgrace. Um, and then of course, we also want preventive programs. Um, for example, uh, Family Foundations is a program uh, which can be given through antenatal uh, classes to uh, parents of, of children about, about to be born and has been shown to have a huge effect on the likelihood of uh, satisfaction uh, in, in the uh, relationship in the years that follow. So I think that um, if anybody asks me, you know, what's the most heroic thing that I can do in life, uh, I would say go into mental health. That's the barricades of the 21st century. Now, let, let's go uh, back uh, to a, a bit more to prevention um, and talk a bit about child well-being. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's, uh, there's a shocking tendency to talk about everything uh, to do with children as a, a, a preparation for adult life. Uh, and of course, uh, childhood is one of the main periods of life and human experience. Um, and we ought to be caring about child well-being for its own sake and not just because it affects uh, the resulting adult. So. Um, we want, obviously, if our goal uh, is the greatest happiness, um, we want the goal for schools to be to develop capacities that will increase their happiness and the happiness of the rest of society. Uh, and it really is important to get educators to think of it like that. We can't have our schools being exam factories as if producing passes at an exam. Uh, um, is, is a, a serious ultimate objective of education. Um, so here are four steps that I'm going to suggest um, could be used in schools to um, produce happier and more rounded children. First, there needs to be a wellbeing code. Then there needs to be teaching of life skills once a week at least. Good discipline and measuring happiness. Let's go through them. So these are the sort of things that you can have in a code. I mean, code, children, um, schools have, have, all sorts of schools have all sorts of, of, of codes. This is not necessarily an innovation for every school at all. But I've been very struck by uh, schools that I've been to calling, value, calling themselves value schools, where they have a value of the month, um, which is, is, is widely displayed and talked about uh, in all possible contexts, uh, especially in assemblies, obviously. Um, we have to have teachers who are comfortable discussing values. It's a natural thing to talk about, and also mental health. Um, and we must have, of course, a senior teacher um, who is leading on mental health. That is what the government uh, now are uh, introducing. But we also have to have the life skills of, of one hour a week. Um, and it is crucial that PSHE, as it used to be called, I think it's now called RSHE, um, should be taught in a way that's based on evidence. Um, and this is not probably what happens in most PSHE lessons. Uh, so uh, here's an example of an evidence-based course. There, there, are, there are many others, but we tried to produce a complete curriculum uh, an hour a week um, for secondary schools from 11 to 15 um, with detailed manualized materials which can only be 
effectively used by teachers who have been trained to use them. This is absolutely crucial because some of you may know the SEAL uh, project um, at the end of the Labour government, which was shown to have had no effect in secondary SEAL uh, on anything. Uh, it's very easy to be well-intentioned. You've got to use things which really have evidence behind them of success. And uh, so we searched the world for these 10 modules that had already been successfully trialed and we combined them together to cover the whole um, PSHE the curriculum. And that we also added in some issues to do with parenting, life goals, mental disorders, media and mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness, of course, is a, a wonderful thing for every child to learn how to calm themselves. This is something you're not meant to talk about, school discipline, but we know that it's not only that it impedes learning, 43% of children say it's diff often difficult to work because of indiscipline, but it's also disturbing. It produces a sense of of, of unease, of a, a disordered world in which you live. The, the remarkable thing is that we can teach us, teach teachers um, to produce a calm and constructive atmosphere in the classroom. Uh, and the Incredible Years is a remarkable program which was developed for teaching parents um, how to uh, handle their children. Um, if their children were, were difficult, with enormous success worldwide. Um, and it's now available for teaching teachers how to handle their children. And I would love to see that offered to every teacher in the country. And then finally, uh, if we really want schools to stop being exam factories, um, there has to be something, some other measurement uh, put in the scales uh, to balance that. And that is the case for measuring the happiness of the children. Obviously not judging the school by how happy as children are because they, they uh, <coughs> some of them may differ in their initial happiness uh, from other schools, but uh, looking at the improvement or otherwise in the happiness of children as they go through the school. I think in, in Britain, this would have to be voluntary. In the Netherlands, it's, it's automatic. Uh, the Netherlands has a national uh, um, questionnaire, which is administered to every child every year and centrally processed. Um, I think in Britain, it have to be voluntary, but I think once a number of schools do it, all the others will have to, because if the data are made public, at the school level, um, parents will insist on being able to see them for every school. Um, should be centrally managed to reduce the cost. Um, and you'd be asking questions to uh, teachers um, and, and, and to pupils over 10. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to after children leave school and university. They go to work. Um, what should be the goal of the employer of an enterprise? Indeed, what, what, if we're talking about the private sector, what is business for? Um, many uh, CEOs in Britain will tell you it's simply uh, to enhance happiness of the shareholders. That is not actually what the company law says in Britain. Um, and what is remarkable is how opinion is changing so quickly. And in America, the US Business Roundtable last August produced a statement saying that they uh, considered that they had duties uh, toward the well being not only of the shareholders, but the workers, customers, uh, and suppliers. And it has to move in that direction. Now, as far as the workers are concerned, um, obviously, uh, there are problems in many workplaces. Um, here is almost the most extraordinary fact to emerge from the science of happiness. Uh, this is when you get people to uh, record uh, their previous day 
experience and how happy they were uh, at each uh, episode of the day uh, and who they were with at that time. And both in Britain and America, the least happy time uh, for uh, people on average is, guess what, when they're with their boss. I mean, what an appalling reflection on our quality of management um, that bosses who should be inspiring their workers are, are, are turning them off. Uh, can't be good for productivity, even, but it's certainly not good for well-being. There have been lots of experiments uh, in how we can improve the well-being of workers. Uh, one of them organised from MIT that I report there shows that giving them more control of their work uh, situation, how the work is organised, raised the happiness by 11% and reduced quitting by 33%. Then there's the other issue where we see barbarity or barbarians at work. And, and this is when people are working in teams, um, but the team leader is told to rank their performance uh, so that they can be paid differently. This is absolutely horrible. Um, and it creates um, in, uh, incredible uh, misery by for people who feel they've been too 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 uh, uh, lowly rated um, and tension um, and no strong evidence uh, of any advantage uh, in terms of performance. Um, here's at the bottom evidence from. Um, a, a Danish study of 300,000 people who turned out that when performance-related pay was introduced, ranking, based on ranking, within teams, um, it led to 6% uh, um, of those people taking antidepressants in excess of how many were before. Just, just awful. So teams, teams should be rewarded on the basis of team performance and not individual performance. <clears throat> and then finally, the government. Um, I'm a sort of pseudo politician, I suppose, so I'm very, very keen that we should have our government uh, with the well being or happiness of the people uh, as its overarching objective, uh, the same one that I laid out at the beginning of this talk. So, what would that mean? Well, it would obviously mean a completely different way of setting priorities. And when um, a department went to the Treasury for money, uh, the Treasury would say to it, uh, well, how much uh, well-being uh, are you producing for each uh, pound that you spend on each of these policies, which you say are so important? And we would um, have to look at policies, each policy in terms of the net increase in happiness relative to the net cost um, and choose those policies uh, which ranked highest on that criterion. And I think from many things that I've already said, um, you would find that the priorities were very, very different uh, from those of, of all the political parties uh, at, at, the, at the moment. Um, I mean, in particular, I think it's obvious that um, the idea that in our present situation, um, what we need is a lot more expenditure on our physical infrastructure. This must be completely crazy. Um, obviously, um, if we um, have some uh, additional money, uh, which, we, we, which we can have, um, the top priority is to rebuild our social infrastructure, uh, to rebuild our health service, uh, our social care, our children's centres, our youth centres, our elderly people centres, our community services. These make huge differences to people's lives. A railway from London to Birmingham that cuts 20 minutes off the cost make, well, how much difference do you think it would make to people's lives? Just very, very small amount of difference. Um, so radical new way of looking at priorities and with radical outcomes. Any chance that the government would do it this way? Well, this is, the, this is in their interest. 
because my colleagues have done this extraordinary work, which show, and there's, there's actually five or six papers, but this is the first one. In European elections, the votes cast for the government are better explained by the happens to the people and by all economic variables combined. Uh, and this has been shown again and again that uh, differences between voting uh, for Trump, for example, in, in different US counties is better explained by the happiness of the people than by their economic situation. Because the correlation, remember, the correlation between happiness and economic situation uh, is quite is quite small across people and, and likewise across areas. So this is the thing to incentivize uh, the politicians. This fact is in their interest to make happens to the people their objective. Um, and as I was saying before, uh, the pr new priorities have got to be the social infrastructure that are the kind I've been talking about, mental health, schools, community organisation, and of course, income support. I think that this is coming in quite fast now, this way of thinking. Uh, the OECD um, agreed that the well-being of the people um, was the objective of government uh, in uh, uh, 2016. <laughs> More recently, the EU um, said that the well-being of the people should be at the center of policy design um, in the document produced last October. The countries that have actually done it uh, are the three that I mentioned below, um, which is uh, New Zealand, wonderful Prime Minister, um, Scotland uh, and Iceland, um, all these three prime ministers were female. I think that's not an accident. Uh, they have all had well-being uh, budgets. Uh, and I think it's time uh, that we had a country with a male prime minister uh, that had a well-being budget. Um, I just want to end up by saying that I think that <clears throat> the COVID has produced a new context for thinking about all of this. Um, and, and there are really two r remarkable things that have happened in this COVID episode. First, um, individuals have become much more aware of the things that really matter to them than they were before. And I think they will therefore be willing to carry that forward into uh, their, life, their life post COVID and the things that they demand of governments post-COVID. But I think the other thing that's been changed by COVID is that all sorts of things which were simply not considered possible have suddenly be become possible. I mean, we've been fur furloughing a third of the British workforce paid for by the state. This is sort of unimaginable. So it's absolutely on the cards that we can have a real uh, happiness revolution in government um, in the coming years. Uh, I think that a lot of politicians are up for it. Um, a lot of civil servants are up for it. Um, and they have been, some of them, trained by the Work Centre for Wellbeing to be able to do it. But much most important is the public is up for it. I think that people are increasingly uh, psychologically aware. Um, they do think that uh, what actually matters is the quality of your life as you experience it, not some externals, but the actual uh, sense which your life makes to you. I think that's a huge, hugely important change, a hugely important positive change. And of course, um, people have become very, very interested uh, in what is happening to uh, the people around them. So I think that we've got, with the combination um, of a new goal and the science to support it, we've got the basis for creating uh, a much happier society, and I'm pretty confident we'll do it. So thanks ever so much for listening, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing uh, your questions, which I, I think Kate's about to ask me. <clears throat>
Yes, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I share some of your optimism, I think, around um, the impact that the pandemic is having, the possibilities that it's opening up for change. But we've been doing some um, surveys in Bradford within our Born in Bradford family studies. Um, and we're finding that under lockdown, 40% of parents have got clinical levels of depression and 40% have got clinical levels of anxiety. And that's a significant rise from before the pandemic. Are we actually building up a sort of a, a ticking sort of time bomb of mental health problems among both adults and children um, that we're going to struggle to address as we come out from lockdown? And what happens if we have to do lockdown all again in the winter? Well, I hope we're not building up a, a long-term uh, increase in the problem because the problem is big enough already. <laughs> Um, and some of it is, is obviously temporary. Um, but I think that this is a wake-up call, uh, and, and I think it's going to be taken as such. It's a wake-up call for looking at mental health as not the Cinderella part of the NHS, um, but uh, an absolutely crucial part of the NHS. Um, I mean, here's an extraordinary figure. If you look at the total more measures of morbidity, I'm sure you know this, Kate, if you look at the morbidity of people uh, under 60, half of all morbidity is mental illness. It's, it's not just a, a sort of per, peripheral uh, disease. It is, for people under 60, uh, it is half of all disease. Um, and yet, if you look at the expenditure in the National Health Service, where we've got 13% on mental health, it's just completely inadequate. And, and physical problems of much less importance are routinely treated automatically. Uh, so mental health uh, uh, is, uh, as I say, affects something like 20% of the population of whom uh, only a third are in treatment. I mean, we would simply never consider this for any serious form of physical illness. Um, I, what I actually want is um, a separate budget for mental health. Um, ever since I've been interested in this, which is 20 years, uh, mental health has been one of the three priorities of the NHS. Uh, and they've always said it's got to grow faster than the rest of the NHS. It never has. It's not changed an, an inch um, at that 13%. So we, we need a separate budget. Um, I, I've suggested that um, the, the, the re, in real terms, the budget for mental health should go twice as fast as for physical health. Uh, and that's, that's really important. Okay, I have a question from um, Lena. And, and this is a question I've, I've heard people ask before in the past. I'd be interested to see how you answer it. She asks, do genes, ethnicities and origins um, play a role in happiness? Um, she says people in India are happier have a lower suicide rate than people in Sweden, even though their quality of life, their healthcare system and social support are less. What's the first word? Genes. Genes. Yeah. Now, genes obviously play a role. Um, and um, I mean, this is well documented. I don't like the heritability, the concept of heritability uh, 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 estimates because um, they include inheritability all in all, all features of your experience, which are correlated with your genes. But um, I mean, they do have give estimates of 40% 40, 40 or something heritable. But it doesn't mean to say you can't do anything about anything that has a high heritability. Of course you can. Uh, height is 90% heritable, but it's, it's changed enormously over the last century. So but we can totally ch change uh, our, our um, mental well-being um, even if we don't change our, our genes. Um, I'm surprised to hear what you said about India because in the World Happiness Report, um, India um, is not as happy uh, as European countries. Um, and I think that um, the, 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 there is a, is a clear uh, effect um, of income. Uh, on uh, happiness, which 
It's particularly striking, actually, much more striking when you compare countries than when you compare individuals within a country. Uh, so um, I, I think that the, the fight against world poverty uh, is one of the most important fights uh, going on uh, uh, at, at, at present. Uh, and I, I, I would not want anybody to uh, uh, go slow on that. <laughs> on on well-being grants. Um, a question from um, someone who's anonymous, but they ask about how can we grow kindness, how ah. can we create kindness in people, and is that the underpinning um, tool for creating happiness in ourselves well, and others? Well, I've, I've, uh, the, the last two talks which I gave <laughs> around well-being in general, I mentioned. Uh, the view of uh, my dear friend Mathieu Ricard, who's a French uh, Buddhist monk, um, which is that what you need to cultivate um, is unconditional benevolence. That's to say, if somebody behaves, bad, behaves badly to you, you don't behave badly to them. Um, and I mentioned this, and I think the these were talks, 40-minute 40, 40 talks. I just threw this out as a single sentence. The remarkable thing was that the, the host, the equivalent of Kate, both the hosts picked out <laughs> that statement <laughs> as the most interesting thing I'd said. And I think it, it is extremely interesting because if you just try applying it to yourself, uh, you'll see how different it is from the way in which you normally react. I mean, it's different from the way you normally react to how people behave to you. It's also different from how, how you view other people sitting opposite you in the tube. Um, I mean, do you, do you try to feel a sense of benevolence toward them? And there's no doubt that kindness can be cultivated. There are good courses, Buddhist courses on developing compassion. Um, and I, 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 but it's not just a matter of courses, obviously, it's a matter of habits that become a part of your, your daily practice. And um, I, ho I hope that, that these words, um, kindness and compassion, um, will become, well, perhaps kindness is, is already part of our vocabulary, but generally kindness means not being unkind. Mm. <laughs> being positively kind is something very different from not being unkind. Um, and ethics, of course, um, is about what you, what you should do as well as what you should not do. So I think it's a lovely question. I think you should cultivate uh, compassion in your heart because it's, it's got to be a feeling as well as a, a behavior. Um, it's one of the most important things you can possibly do, particularly because you will benefit too, as the, the Dalai Lama always says, um, from all of these acts of kindness, um, you benefit as much as the, the beneficiary. Um, and I think we, all of us, um, part of the time, experience other people as a source of threat. And we, we absolutely have to remember that they're human beings like us, and they are insecure like us, <laughs> and they deserve uh, our benevolence. Um, I've got so many other questions here, but I think we're just about out of time. So I think mm -hmm. I'll probably um, stop here and just remind everybody that the recording of this event um, is going to be available on the festival YouTube channel, which you can access from the watch again section of the festival website, um, but it won't appear for for a couple of days. I did want to have enough time to say a proper thank you to you, Richard, for um, spending time with the audience today um, from your, your, your lockdown situation. You've got a nice blank screen behind you. I've been seeing an awful lot of the spare bedrooms of my colleagues, but but you look as if you're in somewhere a little bit more um, 
com. <laughs> um, but thank you for taking the time to join us online. It's it's challenging speaking to an audience when you can't see their reactions and, and, and you, don't, you don't get that sort of live feedback from them. So thank you for, for being willing to do that. Um, to the audience, if you would like to purchase a copy of Richard's book, Can We Be Happier? That's available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. And for more information on book sales, again, go to the festival website. We very much hope that you'll continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Um, check out the website for full details of all the events in the festival programme, and we'd love to hear your feedback. And you can continue the conversations using the hashtag um, York Ideas. Um, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for attending. We are right up at two o'clock. So <laughs> thank you all very, very much and hope to see you all again well, at an online you. or other events soon. Thank you, Kate, and thank you all for listening so much.